guard your pepperonis. <laughs> Back in the 2000s, it wasn't uncommon for one of the big cartoon networks at the time, namely Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, to have larger budget theatrical or made-for-TV movies based on one of their popular cartoons airing at the time. Now, these were made for various reasons besides hopefully trying to net a large number of viewers. They could either serve as origin stories for the original shows, heartfelt finales that aimed to please the fans, or they just wanted to make a larger, more ambitious episode of the original show or to commit sin. Going into the 2010s, these movies stopped popping up as much and honestly, no one really talks about them a whole lot, which is rather strange to me. You'd think a larger budget extension of a popular series would eventually be talked about on the same level as the show it spawned off of. Many of these movies were actually pretty successful ratings-wise and were mostly well received by critics. And even if they weren't, their connection to the original show should at least see them be brought up in conversation more often. But no, whenever I talk about the Wee Bear Bears movie, people tend to stare at me like I have dementia. That's probably a fair assessment given I only remembered regular show had a movie like five weeks ago. I'll probably talk more in depth about more of these movies at some point in the future, but today I wanted to give a few examples of Cartoon Network movies that I either found to be rather underrated or Jesus Christ, what is that? And wow, is there a lot of them. Like, way too many for me to cover right now, which is why I've limited this list to movies that I assume people would be more interested in seeing me talk about. And yes, before we begin, I'm aware that Turner Broadcasting took down my Steven Universe movie review earlier this year, and that is partially why it's here in this video so I can give my updated thoughts on it. If any Turner or suits are watching this, I'd like you to know that I am a very dangerous person, and that I own a physical copy of Doom Free. Your next action should be considered wisely. With that out of the way, let's tone things down to be a bit more regular, shall we? <laughs> you get it because. <laughs> Considering the fact that every episode of Regular Show is basically a B-movie blockbuster grounded to 11 minutes and somehow always entertaining, making a movie out of it seems like a daunting task. Almost impossible, actually. What could you possibly do to up the stakes and make this installment of the franchise stand out when compared to the absolute insanity that is the rest of the series? This was the original Chainsaw Man pacing. Each episode was already a case study on of how to successfully build an adult show masquerading as a children's show off of a nightmare blunt rotation. So, Mr. Quintel thought to himself, most likely doing a bowl in the shower. How do we approach this problem? Simple. We take the main foundation of the series, Mordecai and Rigby's friendship, and make it the central conflict of the series. Not in a way that previous episodes handled it by causing them to have a petty argument that often led to straight up murder, Jesus Christ, but taking the entire friendship itself and building a tragic story around it involving time travel. And hardened future versions of the main cast who are involved in an intergalactic war, all stemming from a school teacher using a time machine that Mordecai and Rigby made when they were in high school. Oh, and also throwing Rigby forging a rejection letter from Mordecai's university and tying that to the plot and having it, you get the picture. It's insane, it's completely off the walls, it's regular show, the movie. It's about as regular show as you could possibly get, and it was about as regular show as regular show could have possibly regular showed back in 2015 before the finale proceeded to out regular show the regular show. I really like this movie, and while it doesn't get talked about too often, I'm glad that more people recently have remembered that it did in fact exist at some point in history. I mean, it brought in 2 million viewers on its premiere and had a short-lived cinema run, so you'd expect at least a few people to remember it happened. But when you talk about regular show, no one really brings it up when talking about the entire series. And that's kind of because if you watch all of regular show from start to finish and leave the movie out, despite how much the movie develops both Mordecai and Rigby and puts so much emphasis on that tragic results day and how much Rigby screwed Mordecai's life over, you won't actually be missing too much. Consequences of this movie don't have much of an effect on the main series, which is incredibly common for a lot of movies based on shows. I think My Hero Academia has like three of the f***ing things. But given how much is dropped on a viewer in this movie, you'd expect for at least some of it to matter more in the main series, besides just bringing back the ship for the finale. Yeah, that's how much respect this movie gets from the main series, they bring back a ship. There's so much substance here and they bring back an aircraft, I'm gonna be sick. But regardless of that, if you're at all familiar with regular show, this should be a pretty comfortable watch, as comfortable as regular show can be anyway. Oi mate, can I borrow your pin? It's still got plenty of the show's dark jokes hinging on the bizarreness of its world, the animation is about on par of the show, the music is great as per usual, it has the single greatest scene in all of cinema. Always guard your pepperonis. <laughs> It's just a bigger budget episode of regular show and it's pretty fun. Definitely deserves more attention. Hey, 
Turner suit. Since I know you're likely still watching this video in your empty bed for two, I'm gonna torture you by making my new review of the Steven Universe movie as uncopyrightable as possible. File the copyright claim and I'll introduce you to my lawyer, Kazuma Kiryu. I'm sure you'll get along just fine. So the Steven Universe movie is technically the show's second conclusion out of three if you look at it a certain way. I mean, no one had any idea that Future was going to be a thing after this movie premiered and the film ends with a pretty good sense of finality. Like if the series ended here, I'm sure most people would have been satisfied. But now it's in this weird position where it's an entertaining movie, but just doesn't really have anything interesting to say. Nor does it really do much to confirm to anyone why it exists besides introducing Spinel. And yeah, I agree, Spinel is peak and I love her, but looking at the movie now, it just feels odd. Carrying on from the end of the original series, Steven Universe the movie essentially goes all out with pretty much every good aspect that people liked about the show. The animation, colouring and backgrounds are the prettiest they've ever been. They got studio goddamn trigger on some of these sequences. It fully embraces the musical side of Steven Universe by making the entire movie one big musical. Lapis gets more than one minute of screen time, you're spoiling us here, but at the same time it also amplifies a lot of the things people don't like about the series, like it's rather shaky storytelling. The show, above all, was mainly something that made you feel things, and while it is capable of moving you, pretty powerfully actually, at many points in the original and with Spinell's backstory in this movie, the storytelling struggles shine through more than ever when it comes to translating Steven Universe into a feature length movie, and thinking about the plot for more than five minutes shows just how much it's being held together by duct tape. Aside from the fact that this movie is basically just a retread of each of the Crystal Gems backstories and development but in an abridged format through songs, making it kind of pointless for longtime fans even if it is pretty heartwarming and entertaining, Spinell's place in the story, being one of the most important parts, is heavily flawed when you stop to think about where she got the rejuvenator and the injector from in the first place. It really does fall apart. Not even the canon explanations outside of what the film gives you are very conclusive. It's like they realised halfway through production that it wasn't very well explained and so their explanation can just be summed up as a quick, ooh. Also I still have my issues with the show constantly finding new ways to show how much of a bastard Pink Diamond was, but that's for another video. Overall the Steven Universe movie is a pretty good representation of the show itself. It has some of its greatest strengths being amplified to heights that are worthy of a theatrical runtime, but also amplifies the same things the show struggled with during its run. Regardless the animation is great, the voice acting is top notch, Sarah Styles as Spinell is divine casting, she slayed this role, the film is constantly entertaining, and the music as expected is fantastic, especially the song that plays when Stephen fuses with Greg. Okay, I changed my mind. <laughs> Like many kids who grew up with Cartoon Network in the 2000s, Ben 10 was my first ever obsession. To this day, across the original series, Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, even Omniverse, as much as the series makes adult me want to commit arson, still has a place in my heart. We will not be discussing the reboot, the arson urges manifest into first degree manslaughter. And even though it's been a hot minute, well, a hot seven years since I last watched an episode of the series, I still feel confident in calling it one of my favourite cartoons of all time. Race Against Time made me want to seek a mental hospital. I remember watching this as a kid and thinking it sucked bad. Take everything wrong with that weird live action phase that Cartoon Network went through a while back and just apply it to Ben 10. The acting is about what you'd expect from a Cartoon Network live action movie with a $4 million budget. Oh my gosh, it's working. I won't believe it! It's not very good. What's worse is the CGI, and I get that this was a low budget live action adaptation of a popular kids cartoon made for kids, and I'm aware that this movie was made in 2007, and that this is kind of technically impressive for the time given the budget. It doesn't change the fact that the movie still looks like dog water. This frame should be classified as a sin in the New Testament. As for the story, I struggle to recall even half of it, because I'm just constantly perplexed at how awful everything surrounding it is. Like, the camera work in this movie. Dear God, what are you doing? It's the Death Note 2017 zoom. Each scene feels like it was done with a single take and they just don't bother to redo anything. The framing is weak, the camera work in general is way too loose. The Omnitrix looks cool, I'll give them that. Everything else feels like... You fight me, I fight you, one of us goes home happy. Look, there's being low budget and then there's just not caring. Next we have Ben 10, Alien Swarm. Now take everything I said about the race against time into consideration, right? Now imagine it was directed by Zack Snyder. At least Racing Its Time kept the colours bright, and I get that Alien Force and Ultimate Alien are much darker compared to the original series, but just staring at Alien Swarm for more than 5 seconds makes me feel depressed. The CGI is slightly better, I mean they had a bigger budget for this once, so that's expected, but I wonder if all the aliens just look better because the entire film was colour graded by a funeral photographer. The acting is about the same, except now it's a little more excusable in places. That's kinda whatever. The story is about as forgettable as the first movie, although by 
skimming Wikipedia, I did find that the movie was written during the 2007 to 2008 writer's strike, which now makes this movie incredibly funny in retrospect. One thing I'll give each film is that the casting is pretty on point for both the younger versions of the characters and the older ones. Now Ben's not going to be the same for me without hearing Yuri Lowenfall, but I still can't deny that the casting choices are pretty great. And I mean, in terms of identity, these are still unquestionably Ben 10. As opposed to a lot of other live action adaptations that strip the identity of the source material away. So while these movies are mostly kinda sh I can at least applaud them for doing the bare minimum. All anyone talks about when it comes to the Powerpuff Girls movie is that it was a box office bomb that single-handedly killed the franchise and also assisted in the complete removal of 2D animation from theatrical releases. You'll find it pretty challenging to find many people outside the Powerpuff Girls fandom who actually want to discuss this film's existence or have even watched it themselves. Its reputation is more than enough for most people, and if you're looking at this from an outsider's perspective, you may be inclined to think this movie was some sort of atrocity. Well, I mean, it didn't stop Alien Swarm from getting 4 million viewers on its premiere, but honestly, I sat down to watch it for the first time a few years ago and I really struggled to find any reason for why it has such a poor reputation from the few that have actually watched it who don't constantly bring up its miserable box office performance. It's essentially an ext- <laughs> oh. It's essentially an extended origin story for the Powerpuff Girls based on what was told in the show's iconic intro, showing everything from their accidental creation and showing how they earned the town's trust, while also giving an origin story for Mojo Jojo. Now this movie was made when the Powerpuff Girls TV show was going through really bad seasonal rot. If you need any more context for that, there's an episode where the girls are just stuck in bed crying in agony while peeling from a sunburn and showing close-ups of it, and that is the most you're gonna get from me because I don't feel like I'm blurring this footage. So the writing quality at this point in the franchise's lifespan isn't particularly great and it shines through a bit in this film. From being incredibly slow paced in the first half to suddenly developing a crack addiction in the second half, the movie doesn't have a very good grasp of pacing. But when the movie does get going with the action, suddenly everything about it seems to improve, including the jokes. You know, I've got a nice car. One of Powerpuff Girls' greatest strengths was its speed, and that strength was lost when the show began doing 20 minute episodes which led to the show feeling much less enjoyable. When the movie kicks it into high gear combined with the higher budget the movie naturally has compared to the show, it leads to some pretty fun scenes and pretty entertaining action. However, despite these strengths, nothing else about the film is anything to write home about. The plot is paper thin and only really accomplishes its main task of giving the girls and Jojo an origin story. In some areas it takes itself a bit too seriously and it doesn't really land because it lacks the confidence to write anything that demands these slower scenes. And overall, it feels far too much like they just extended an episode of the show into a feature length runtime, and not in a good way like a regular show. I mean, they literally stretch several scenes and gags out for way longer than necessary. That tag scene where they go from the playground and all across Townsville is nearly 10 minutes long, and given how short the film is overall, that's frankly a tremendous waste of time for something that got old within the first five minutes. Extended episode is typically thrown around as an insult towards bad TV movies. But but sometimes a show keeping what made its episodes so great and translating them to feature length can go well. But when you're this blatant about filling up the runtime with filler, it isn't very excusable, and it's exactly why that insult was coined in the first place. So while the Powerpuff Girls movie isn't exactly terrible, it is painfully mid, and I wouldn't recommend you go out your way to watch it, even if you're a fan of the series. But at the same time, I wouldn't suggest you avoid it like the plague either. <laughs> I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I haven't watched We Bear Bears in a very long time. How long, I have no idea, and why is definitely a mystery, because I remember absolutely loving this show when it first aired. It was an incredibly comfortable and laid back show that was easy to watch after a long day at school and it never lost sight of that. I also always loved how casual it was when bringing in elements from pop culture and the internet in specific episodes, and how it never fell into any of these cringy traps that other shows fall into by trying to force themselves to be relevant. We Bear Bears was pretty great from what I remember. I don't know what caused me to stop watching it specifically, I think I was just really lazy, but only a few weeks ago did I find that the show ended in 2019 and that it had a movie released in 2020 that was intended to be a conclusion for the original series. Even as someone who hadn't been keeping up with the show, I thought I might as well check it out. And uh, it's certainly We Bear Bears, but something about it feels very odd. Firstly, the movie tries to do some very basic social commentary and discrimination by having the people of the city be sick of the bears and wanted them to go away. So then they go on a road trip to Canada, and like, it sounds simple enough as a plot that they could easily make work. But the the 
whole discrimination angle feels incredibly surface level and hardly the main focus of the film. It appears at the beginning and the very end, that's literally all there is to it. And the villain of the film is just kind of boring and lame and sh**. There's potential for him to be interesting, but he's instead incredibly two-dimensional and just exists to fill the role of an antagonistic force chasing after the bears. And I don't know what it was about the comedy in this film, but it felt incredibly forced compared to how laid back and casual the series was. Or at the very least what I remember it being. The show has always had references to modern culture and the internet and made jokes about them before, but it's really cranked up in this movie and I can't say any of it was very funny. And why this movie had to have musical segments, I don't really know, but they're really bad, I guess. The singing isn't very good at all and the jokes just feel extremely forced and unnatural. The most interesting part about the film is the relationship between the bears themselves, especially Grizz acting like the older brother. But like the faint discrimination message, it needed to have more to it because despite having some rather intense moments between the bears going on as they argue about what they should do, I'm never really given much of a reason to care. The whole film feels super ambitious but incredibly half-baked writing-wise. It has a number of the strengths the original show had but also takes many of the things the original show did exceptionally well and proceeds to fail at them the same way other cartoons have fallen victim to. Especially of the humour. I can at least give praise to the animation and backgrounds because while the animation itself isn't too far off from the original series, it still looks pretty good and the backgrounds are consistently nice to look at and really add to the chill vibe the whole series has. I could tell from watching this movie that it is mainly dedicated to the fans and just wants to provide them a decent enough conclusion and there's nothing wrong with that at all. And I do think the film is okay, but there's just a lot that I loved about the original series that's either missing or just poorly executed here. And I think that's a real shame. Yeah, wow, that's uh, that's so great for you, Cartoon Chi, but uh, unfortunately, they aren't the words of me, famous Z-list internet micro-celebrity just stopped, so I don't think the people are gonna be satisfied without my input on this film. Braxton, how the f*** did you get in here? Well, I noticed you've gotten so good at stealing my video ideas, you've started making them before me, so I thought, hey, might as well do some self-advertisement while you're ripping me off. Wait, I'm sorry, let me get this straight. You come onto my channel, are hijacking my review, and are calling me gay. Yeah, now shut it. I don't like the Wee Bear Bears movie either, but not for the same reasons that you don't like it. So shut up, bitch. What I really hate about this movie isn't just that the humor's hit or miss and the discrimination allegory isn't clear, it's that it feels like a movie written by someone who's only seen a few episodes of the show, which is ironic considering it has 14 writers, but also, it's not totally unexpected. See, when the crew behind a cartoon is asked to create a film, they usually have to make it on top of their regular workload for a season, so the staff working on a project sort of get rotated in and out as production goes, making things a little complicated. On occasion, this approach can lead to good results like the Big Picture Show, or my beloved Operation Zero, but when there's too many voices, it creates this weird jumble of visions and ideas that leads to a disjointed, unspecific final product. And We Bear Bears the movie has exactly that problem. It's a sightseeing buddy comedy. It's a fugitive chase. It's a discrimination allegory. It's a musical. It's a film about family. It's f boring. There were too many voices in the writing room for any to stand out, so they all merged together into this cryptic garble of overused TV movie cliches, completely forgetting the TV show cast in the process. Like, where did they go? We see them at the start saying they don't like what generic villain A is doing, and they react to the final climax as it's happening, but aside from Charlie, they never actually do anything. Why were they even here? Because they're iconic parts of the show that make up its identity? Then why did didn't you make them more important? F you. And f you too, Cartoon She, you British b Brit. I'm out of here. Watch my channel. Peace. Cartoon Network movies tend to be on the bizarre side. Whether it's live action adaptations, a show that's already off the walls insane, be given the opportunity to go even bigger of its ideas, half conclusions to the original series, and failed theatrical outings, I've only really scratched the surface of them in today's video, and I'd like to cover more at some point. But for now, I think we can all live in peace knowing that regular show close all of them and that Turner Broadcasting cannot ever intrude into my apartment due to the dark spells I have placed on them for claiming my Steven Universe videos. I've got one of them locked in the bathroom right now as ransom. You got 24 hours before I throw in a physical copy of Overwatch. <laughs>